Welcome to Conversations with B'nai B'rith International. I'm CEO Dan Mary Ashen. We appreciate your spending some time with us today. My guest today is Dr. Samantha Baskin, a specialist in Jewish art and history, currently on the faculty at Cleveland State University. The author of numerous books, including the Cyclopedia of Jewish American Artists and the Jewish graphic novel, Critical Approaches, Baskin also serves as editor of Pennsylvania State University Press's Dimyonot, Jews and the Cultural Imagination, a series of publications that take an innovative approach to topics ranging from Jewish life in China to the poetry of Heinrich Heine. Baskin is currently a 2020 research fellow through the National Endowment for the Humanities, the second time she has received this prestigious award. In our conversation today, Baskin and I will focus on the impact of Jewish art in America and the subject of her most recent book, The Warsaw Ghetto in American Art and Culture. We'll also explore some of her previous works and her current book project. Professor Baskin, it's good to have you with us today. Welcome. Thank you for the kind introduction, Dan. I'm glad to be here. So before we start, we always talk about definitions, and let's talk about Jewish art. Is it art by Jewish artists? It could be art that is not Jewish, but by Jewish artists. Or is it art with Jewish subjects? Or is it something in between? So that's a very loaded question. When I first started addressing this subject, I had to kind of figure out the parameters for myself. And there's no pat answer. <clears throat> so in other words, when I first started studying Jewish art, I felt, let me put up some slides, I thought that Jewish art was Judaica. Ritual objects, I have two Hanukkiahs up right now, one on the left is from 1850, and then one on the right from 1986. And they're really interesting. Judaica is fascinating art for ritual purposes, Sabbath, or holidays, or life cycle times. And these two are diverse, obviously, but I soon wanted to kind of flesh out what else can Jewish art be beyond ritual objects. And as I looked further, what I kept coming back to was, oh, Jewish art is Marc Chagall, the quintessential Jewish artist. And he's European, not American, which is my specialty. And then I hear, you know, there's much information about Agam, who's on the right, an op artist from Israel. So I had to dig in further. And in the end, my definition, my working definition for what I do came about by discovering this painting. I was in graduate school and I was actually studying 18th century French art. I was in a sociology of modern art class. I saw this painting on the cover of a catalog and I fell in love with it. I needed to know more. And it's by Raphael Sawyer, it's called Dancing Lesson. It's from 1926. And it's small, it's only 24 by 20 inches. And in short, I looked at this painting, I was, it was held up as the quintessential example of Jewish American art. But I had to figure out why, it was very superficially discussed. And what we have here is Raphael Sawyer, who was a immigrant from Russia, his right, the family's right to live permit was revoked. So he's in his 20s and he paints this dancing lesson. You're looking in the front at his brother, Mo, twin brother Moses dancing with Rebecca, the sister. And it's really about generations. We have the younger generation learning how to dance American style. And then sitting on the couch playing the harmonica is another brother Israel. We have the Sawyer mother on the left, she's holding Der Tog, a Yiddish paper, and on the right, the father. And the slide isn't bad. The grandmother is actually cut off here in the painting. And then we have a portrait of ancestors in the old world on top. And it kind of, it has like, it's oversized. The, the Sawyer family wouldn't have been able to haul this painting across the ocean. And it's oversized because I think there's an outsized um, memory of the old world, perhaps even romanticized, like it's a simpler time than when you're having this, you know, challenge within generations, the older generations having trouble understanding the new generation who's much more Americanized. So this painting codified what I think is Jewish art. 
it's a, a Jewish artist is the number one criteria. But I think then the work of art needs to have Jewish content, either overt or covert. The Jewish content could be encoded. It could be something about the artist's Jewish identity that we need to tease out. So this was the beginning of my Jewish art journey. I forgot about 18th century French art and I started trying to find works of art about the Jewish American experience. Let me just ask one other question about, about Jewish art as it relates to the, the biblical injunction against graven images. And you know, we've always been, been told that uh, that, that injunction uh, perhaps um, caused Jews to move in a different direction. So you had, uh, we had the slide up about the uh, Hanukkiot, um, where work really went into silver or in, in, in Syria, for example, in, in copper. Uh, or in, in some other, uh, some other means of, of, of doing that art, but not necessarily having the images of, of, of people uh, or animals, let's say. Um, how, did, how did that affect the, the flow of Jewish art over the centuries? So that's the question that I get a lot. So the second commandment, thou shalt not make any graven images, is generally misinterpreted. So we're not supposed to make images that we worship. And I think it's misinterpreted by more observant Jews. We can make art that is beautiful. We're not supposed to worship it. So Christians, for Catholics, you know, think about the Italian Renaissance and all of our images of Jesus being crucified or Mary. And if Jews don't do that, we can have an art. We have a tradition. And the aspersion that Jews do not make art <clears throat> has been cast a lot, that they don't have creative ability. Was, for example, Wagner said, Jews do not have creative ability, they can't make art. Well, I think in the end, the reason we don't have a lot of Jewish art is because when you're a diasporic people running from place to place, you can't haul your canvases with you, or you don't have the opportunity to make the art. Jews were excluded from <clears throat> art academies for many, for you know, long time, they didn't have the same opportunities. And Jews are not a nation without art. We had, <clears throat> we had, we didn't have the opportunity to make it. And Jews, there's no canon of Jewish art to this point, though I've been working on it and others are working on it, because art history is defined by nationality and geography, Italian Renaissance art. And if Jews didn't have a nation for a period of time, then they lived in environments where they used the styles of the moment that they lived in. Jews in Italy painted or sculpted in an Italian style or a German style or wherever they were. But in the end, I think the second commandment has also become a talking point. It's not as relevant as some say. So tell me about your newest book, The Warsaw Ghetto in American Art and Culture. What are the central themes and what are some of the ways in which aspects of the Warsaw Ghetto have been incorporated into American culture? Well, the Warsaw Ghetto project was at first born of my desire to find, you know, the band-aid for the gaping wound of the Holocaust. We have, you know, this these young group of Jews who are stubborn, stubbornly clinging to the desire to die with honor and they rise up against their Nazi oppressors. It becomes the archetypal sort of act of resistance. <clears throat> April 19th, 1943, when the Jews rose up, 750 fighters were able to hold off 2,000 SS men for 28 days. And that's longer than the Polish army could hold off the Nazis at the Blitzkrieg. So, you know, it's been called a miracle. It's, it's not a miracle, but it is remarkable. And so I wanted to start writing about that. Let me show a few slides. Here we go. So what interests me, what interested me at first was the fight. And <clears throat> this is actually an Arthur Zick. It was made right after the uprising. What's interesting is how quickly artists and filmmakers, um, um, directors and so forth were interested in the uprising and they highlighted it. You know, this interest in heroism this particular work was made for the Committee to Save the Jews of Europe. So it's art in the service of trying to help the Jews. It's dated 1944. 
as you can see, it actually is from 1943. But this work uses the Bible, biblical um, figures, <clears throat> to make a comment about Jewish strength. The idea that Jews are not going to the gas chambers like sheep to slaughter, they are fighting. So there's Moses at center, he's defiant, he's muscular, he's strong, and he's got Aaron and Hur on either side of him. But it's made, this is a moment that's made for the contemporary time. And <clears throat> what we have here is in the Bible, Moses, when his arms are raised, the Amalekites um, are failing in battle when his arms go down, then they gain strength. And we have that shown with Aaron on the left, dressed in you know, the, the, the attire of an Israeli soldier. And on the right, her has a makeshift, we makeshift weapon like a Warsaw ghetto fighter. So this kind of image was what first attracted me to writing this book. This is a painting by Ben Wilson <clears throat> around 1943, again, right when the uprising happened. And we can again see the fight highlighted. And then we had theater productions right after the fact. This is 1944, and it was a Yiddish play by the Jewish Folk Theater. And this, the photograph that's highlighted from this production, which was in New York and traveled, and the audience was obviously Jews to uplift their spirit because it's in Yiddish. Here's the photograph. You can see this is an elaborate stage set that shows the Jews fighting. So this is what began my journey. And the journey for this book was about, you know, not just fine art, I am an art historian. This was about painting and theater and radio plays and comics. So it covered a vast, you know, vast media. For example, um, this is Leon Uris's Mila 18. So it's a book and it was a best-selling book. It's from 1961. It's the follow-up to Exodus, which many people know better. And in this particular book, we have, you know, the fighting Jew. We, and Uris is, a little bit over the top. You know, there's a lot of purple prose and it's a fictionalized account of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. You're an expert on the, on the Warsaw Ghetto. What is it that inspired you to, to write about this? We have, of course, there are many topics under the, the rubric of the Holocaust. Um, and then of course, there's the flow of Jewish history. So was it something uh, growing up? Was it something, did you take a trip uh, to see um, the, whatever is, is left there in, uh, in Warsaw or in Poland. What was it that drew you to this subject? Well, I have been to Warsaw and Warsaw does not look like Warsaw, you know, appeared during the war. It was mostly destroyed versus Krakow is gorgeous and it's still a beautiful old city. And what I had written several books before this and only addressed the Holocaust tangentially and I felt like I needed to write one book on the Holocaust. It's painful, it's hard to write about. Um, a lot of my family died in the Holocaust, but I felt like I needed to do this. So this is my, this is my contribution to Holocaust thinking. It's a you know, discussion of how Americans have looked at the Holocaust over time. You know, it takes us into the 21st century. Let's talk about your research process uh, for a moment. Um, what surprised you most when putting this book together? Because you've, you've not only got art, which you, you showed with the, the Schick um, illustration and, and the painting, but you've got a film, you've got theater posters. Uh, tell us about how that process worked. Well, it, it really was a detective hunt. And, you know, I fell into a lot of things. I had conversations with different people. I would get catalogs of, you know, films that were made over time. You know, The Eternal Light, what did The Eternal Light show? What kind of radio program? So I just went through lists. And again, I went to the Yiddish Book Center. I, you know, I tried to find what I could, but the biggest surprise for me was a teleplay that Rod Serling of Twilight Zone fame wrote in the presence of mine enemies. It's from 1960 and it was a Playhouse 90 production. It's actually Playhouse 90's final production. They didn't want it at first, but there was a strike 
and they didn't have any, they didn't have a show. So they said, okay, fine, Serling, you can show this. And <clears throat> the interesting things that came from that, first of all, you cannot view it. I had to go to New York City to the Paley Center for Media to see it. I had to go five times. I live in Cleveland and I had to go back. I transcribed the entire script so I could really, you know, delve into it. And then I had to keep going back to really see, once I understood it completely, see how the scenes worked, see the, how the characters worked. So the introduction, you know, welcome to Playhouse 90. You're going to see this production of In the Presence of Mine Enemies, starring, you know, Charles Lawton, you know, this person, this person, and introduce, introducing newcomer, Robert Redford. So a very young Robert Redford, you know, comes onto the screen. He plays the good Nazi. Right, that's, a, that's how he was viewed. And in the end, the shock of it, and I'm gonna share my screen again to show you. Here we go. These are two film stills from it. And as you can, I mean, I, I took them surreptitiously in the Paley Center, so they're not fabulous. <clears throat> but you have a ra Rabbi Heller is the man of faith. He believes if he prays enough, if he believes that everything's gonna be fine. But his son, had, was taken to a work camp, um, he, he managed to get away. And in the top left still, we have him berating his father. You know, it's the idea of the freedom, the trope of the freedom fighter versus the man of faith. And he has says so many horrible things to his dad. You know, he says, stop, stop worshiping. God has moved over to the Nazis now. And he's always in his face when he speaks, you know, there's spittle coming out of his mouth. On the other hand, in the still on the bottom, that's Robert Redford as a young man, and he's praying for forgiveness. <clears throat> he gets on his knees. He asks Rabbi Heller to forgive him. He says, we're not all animals. And he's, he's young and he doesn't, mean Redford's character, Sergeant Lott, he does not have a lot of options. He's in an untenable place. And in the end of this teleplay, he saves Heller's daughter. So he gets her out of the ghetto, whereas Heller's going to die in the ghetto, as is the son, Paul. You know, we um, talk a great deal today, as we should, about um, Holocaust denial, which, which is growing. The further we get away from the Holocaust, um, we, we ha and, and with the help, unfortunately, of the Internet, uh, we have more and more Holocaust denial. Memories are fading. Survivors, of course, now are all, many, most of them into their 90s, late 80s. The importance uh, of, of the book that, that you've written, um, I think is, is tremendous uh, because again, the further we move away from that period, the more we know about it and the symbolism which you have represented in the book, I think is extremely important. Have you had that kind of uh, reaction to the work that you're doing as, as, I've, as I've stated it? There's been very good reaction to this project in part, I mean, it is, it's, it's an analysis. It has got some scholarly elements, but because it's dealing with images and dealing with media that we, you know, that the general popul population understands, movies and paintings and comics, I think it, open, it opens up a really interesting conversation for people. <clears throat> so yes, there's been good reaction to this book. <clears throat> and I think it's just, you know, it's another contribution to our understanding of the Holocaust. And for those deniers, this is proof. There are films made in the 40s and the 50s and novels in the 60s. And these are our reactions to the Holocaust, reactions to the Warsaw Ghetto over time, which change. Serling's production was panned. Every, almost everybody hated it because he dared to introduce something novel. So before we have the muscular Jew, we have you know, the Jew who's willing to stand up. But then Serling, he miscalculated. At this early date in the you know, early 1960s, the public wasn't ready for this kind of nuance. A bad Jew, Paul, right? And I'm using that term broadly. He's the bad Jew versus the good Nazi. And then there was a very kind poll in this as well. Serling is always interested in nuance, but the general public wasn't. And Leon Uris wrote a blistering attack, an open letter to CBS saying, <clears throat> this is worse than even Goebbels could do. And he was prone for overreaction. And <clears throat> so Serling later on, he, I found a letter in his archive. He's got his personal papers in Wisconsin. And I was reading, going through this archive and I found a letter where he said, 
this was, you know, the worst, the worst thing he ever did in his, in his career. He felt horrible about it because it polarized so many people and made people angry because they just weren't ready. Yeah, I recall um, as, a, as a youngster watching with my family and watching some uh, TV programs uh, in the 50s and the 60s, and the, there were many, relatively, there were a number of depictions of Holocaust survivors uh, and their stories. Um, but um, to um, cross what may have been a red line here uh, by Serling, to get into these uh, subjects uh, certainly must have been uh, disconcerting at that particular moment in time, uh, not that long after the end of, of the Holocaust. But I'd like to turn now, if I could, to some of your other interests. You've written and reviewed work about several 19th and 20th century artists, Jewish and non-Jewish, uh, Ben Shan, uh, George O'Keefe, Jack Levine, Audrey Flack, the list goes on. Uh, let's talk about Ben Shan for a moment. Uh, you reviewed Ben Shan's New Deal murals, Jewish identity in the American scene a couple of years ago in 2018. And you said, quote, this broadly researched monograph, jargon free and written in accessible prose, proves to be rewarding reading for those interested in a number of topics, including Jewish American art, American art, government sponsored art, socially conscious art, immigration and labor history, and of course, Ben Shan himself, that's a, that's a full table. Can you tell us a little about Ben Shan and why did you choose to review this book? So academics don't always or really ever choose what books they're going to review. I was asked to review it. And I tend to review books just when like I'm having sort of ebbs and flows in my own research. Like, okay, I need a break from writing this right now. And someone asks me to review and I do. And I chose, and so I said yes, because I'm interested in Ben Sean and I wanted to learn more about Ben Sean. I'm, you know, he, he did work for the government. He did make murals. He worked um, as a photographer for the Farm Security Administration. That's interesting work. He, but what really I like about his art is, for example, this image. I obviously, I chose it to show today. If we got to Ben Sean, it's from 1965 and it's an interracial handshake. And on top, we have Hebrew lettering and English lettering, thou shalt not stand idly by. That's Leviticus 1916. He made it for the American Civil Liberties Union for a fundraising drive. That's the kind of work that interests me, art in the service of making the world a better place. And that, that's, that's what I, I am interested in, Sean and Sawyer as well. Raphael Sawyer did those kinds of works. And they were prevalent for a number of Jewish American artists in the 1930s who made socially conscious works. We call that sort of moment social realism. And an overriding number of social realists happened to be Jewish, Jewish American. So I'm talking about American art. So why is that? And it's been hypothesized that ideas of tikkun olam, that Jews are to repair the world, affected these artists, whether they made Jewish art or not. They, some of them who made socially conscious art did so because of that injunction. It might, you know, it might not be at the surface, but it might be something they, you know, was ingrained in them as children. Then in the 60s, as in this case with Ben Sean and Raphael Sawyer as well, they worked for civil rights, for the newest moment that needed some sort of art commentary. Um, if I can go back to, just for a moment, uh, to Arthur Schick, mm -hmm. um, who's one of, one of my favorites. Um, I have a, a copy of his Book of Job, uh, which uh, has some, some magnificent illustrations, very, very stark, and, and um, he, he covered so many different subjects, um, Jewish and, and American. Um, tell us a little about Schick and where you would place him in, in this canon. So Jik was very prolific and he made some just really interesting works in relationship to the Holocaust. As I mentioned, his Haggadah, I think is his masterpiece. It's beautiful. And it has, you know, it's got so much detail, sort of his, his the Persian miniature detailing make it very compelling 
And uh, certainly, you know, for Passover, you know, there's lots of reproductions. We've used it in my home before. I like that Haggadah quite a bit. And so I think, you know, he's never been considered, you know, a major master. And he, I think that he deserves much more attention than he's received. Um, where he falls, so I don't think, he, I personally don't believe he falls in the canon of Jewish American art. He was born in Poland. He mostly worked in Poland. He did come to the U.S. He made significant works in the U.S., but I'm not so sure how much that Jewish American, that American identity affected his art. He was a Zionist, and a lot of that really interesting pro-Israel work is out there, and his work's accessible. You know, there's reproductions of his Haggadah, of his Book of Esther, and other kinds of volumes that he illustrated. You talk about, you know, he hasn't received perhaps the recognition that he deserves. Um, let me ask a question, not only about Schick, but more broadly. How does that happen? How does it happen that some artists are, are never rediscovered and some are, uh, is, are discovered late in life in terms of the, the broader recognition? Uh, how do you see that process happening? Why does it happen for some and not for others? All right, so a lot of it's luck and being in the right place at the right time. So for example, there was a abstract expressionist named Ari Stillman, who's Jewish. And he was a good abstract expressionist, I, but he left New York and he, he went you know, farther west. So he didn't have the same opportunities that say Jewish abstract expressionists like Barnett Newman and Mark Rothko and Lee Krasner had or Helen Frankenthaler all Jews who are prominent in the abstract expressionist movement. So you need to be in part the right place at the right time and a critic has to take interest in your art, right? You know, Clement Greenberg was a main, and I guess he happens to be Jewish, but he was a, the main art critic for abstract expressionism. And he happened to love Jackson Pollock's art the most. So that's part of it. You know, we have a lot of great artists who don't get the attention they deserve. Once the canon is set, it's hard to resurrect an artist. I, so part of what I like to do is, you know, find artists who are on the fringe so I can do the research and, you know, find out about them and bring it to the larger public, like Raphael Sawyer, who was the subject of my first book. But publishers also might not want to publish a book like that. In this case, they did. But because... <clears throat> You just don't, you know, you, publishers don't necessarily want to publish a book that's not going to make money. Well, it's, um, it's really very interesting, again, about, about Schick, because every time I look at his work, I see something different. You know, it's what you say about Persian miniatures. Um, that's, that's exactly what you have to really focus in, and you can see a lot. There's a lot going on there. Um, earlier this year, uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities uh, selected you as a 2020 Research Fellow, one of the highest awards uh, a humanities scholar can receive. And as I mentioned earlier, this is your second year-long NEH Research Fellowship. You're the only Cleveland State University faculty member to receive this twice. Uh, what is the focus of your fellowship? Uh, how do you normally approach your research process on something like this? And are there any recurring themes that uh, you try to convey in all of your work? I have a great image about my <clears throat> current book project. So my current book project actually has something to do with B'nai B'rith. I'm writing a monograph about an artist named Moses Jacob Ezekiel. Ezekiel, so this is the idea of, do publishers wanna publish a book about an artist that's not canonical, right? not Thomas Aikens or Rembrandt. And, but this particular book is my treasure hunt. This is an absolute detective work. I'm finding his works. This particular work you do not need to find because it's a towering 26 foot tall sculpture in front of National Museum of American Jewish History. And B'nai B'rith commissioned this for the centennial. You can see on the pedestal, it's called- In, in, in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, the world, you know, the, the big fair in Philadelphia. And this was B'nai B'rith's contribution. It was in Fairmount Park, but then the National Museum of American Jewish History moved it to their first location, which is no easy task. It's several tons. And then they moved it to their most recent location. And you can, so was, you can see it's dedicated to the people of the United States by the order B'nai B'rith. 
this, so it's an allegorical woman and she's symbolizing liberty. Her hand is outstretched. She's blessing the people. It was meant to be universal. It wasn't meant to be, you know, Jewish. This was supposed to be a broad statement by B'nai B'rith. We have faith on her to her right, but on the left when we're looking, raising his hand to heaven, holding a lamp. And in my book, I'm arguing that that's the eternal light. Um, then we have an eagle with his talons in a serpent of intolerance. So it's an allegory. Ezekiel, Ezekiel is all about the allegory. This is his first major commission. It was a really big deal. It didn't make it to the centennial on time. The Bene Brith did not have the money, couldn't raise the money to get it on time or pay Ezekiel on time. So <clears throat> Thanksgiving after the fair closes, it's unveiled to great fanfare. And to this day, you know, it's a beautiful sculpture. It represents religious liberty. In front of the museum, there is a little, you know, plaque at the bottom on the cement at the bottom saying, stand here and take your picture with our sculpture of religious liberty. So this Ezekiel project is, this is just the first chapter. I'm trying to find his works throughout the United States, have a list of them at the back, and then each chapter looks at either one work or a huge body of his work, his biblical works, or his sculptures he made for the Corcoran Museum, the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, DC. And I'm just trying to better understand who he is, his contributions to American Jewish art, and they are vast. He was a huge celebrity in his own time. That he's been forgotten by history is really surprising. You know, it's interesting because uh, we were founded in 1843. This is uh, 1876, correct? Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not uh, that long after our founding as we look back now from 177 years. Uh, but at the time, it was... Uh, I, it also represents not only Ezekiel and his work, but I think institutionally, uh, it also represents the tremendous growth in our organization at that time, because this, of course, was just before the great immigration from Eastern Europe. But there were many who would come from uh, Central Europe, Germany primarily, but not only. And the organization at that point was, was really beginning to grow by leaps and bounds. And um, I think not only is there a statement in there about how the American Jewish community through B'nai B'rith felt about the United States of America, but I think also perhaps about how they felt about their organization, that even at that stage, only a few decades after our founding, uh, they could make this contribution uh, to this uh, great moment of, of the centennial uh, in the city of Philadelphia, where so much of our history began. So um, we, uh, we wish you well. Uh, we have an institutional interest in, in your work, uh, and we wish you well uh, professionally, of course, um, as your work uh, unfolds. Um, well, uh, Professor Baskin, I really, I want to thank you um, for this conversation today, uh, telling us more about Jewish art and Jewish artists. Now we will be uh, looking at much of this, perhaps, with a different eye. Um, I want to remind everyone about the book, The Warsaw Ghetto in American Art and Culture. And uh, just to say it's uh, good to have you with us and wishing you a sweet and healthy and peaceful new year. Thank you very much, Dan. I wish you the same. Be safe and well. Thank you. Thanks to Dr. Samantha Baskin for joining me today. And thank you for tuning into this conversation with B'nai B'rith. If you like what you've heard, Make sure you never miss a program by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook. And be sure to visit our website, B'nai to learn more about our work. For my guest, Dr. Samantha Baskin, I'm Dan Mariasha. See you again soon. Take care, everyone.